Good evening, and welcome to Penn State Sports Night. I'm Ava Rash. And I'm Christian Kirpakis. The Penn State Nittany Lions climbed to number two in the latest college football AP poll after a weekend full of upsets to give the top 25 a new look. Defending national champion Clemson were upset by the Syracuse Orange, while the defending Pac-12 champion Washington fell to Arizona State. That paved the way for Penn State, who were on a bye week, to earn their highest ranking since October 31st, 1999, when they were also the second best team in the nation. ESPN's College Game Day is returning to Happy Valley for this weekend's whiteout game against Michigan at 7.30. This will be the sixth time College Game Day has aired from Penn State, but the first time since 2009 when the then fifth-ranked Nittany Lions fell to the Iowa Hawkeyes. The popular pregame show will begin its broadcast from 9 to noon on Saturday and will take place on Old Main Lawn. Speaking of college football, we're going to send it over to Jack Hirsch and David Padalano who will break down what to expect from Penn State in this year's Wild game and give their thoughts on the rest of the college football world. Hello and welcome to our college football segment on Penn State Sports Night. Joined by Jack Hirsch and David Padalano, I'm Matt Freiler. So during the bye week, Penn State fans sat back and watched four top 10 teams fall. Clemson, Washington, Washington State, and Auburn were all victims of road losses against unranked teams. The result was a major shakeup in the polls with 6-0 Penn State rising to number two, the Nittany Lions' highest ranking since 1999. So Jack, with the first set of college football playoff rankings being released on October 31st in about two weeks, what are your thoughts on the current playoff picture? What playoff picture? Uh, it's, it for the, for the most part, it's October. We don't really know what the playoff picture is right now at this moment, so there, there's so many things that are going to happen. For, for the most part, Penn State's about to play the hardest games on its schedule. Georgia has yet to be really tested, so we'll see what's going to happen with that and how they're going to play out moving forward. But I know, obviously, some big teams lost this weekend, and uh, David, you picked some of those teams. Yeah, I have to pick three of those teams. One of them being Clemson, dropped from two to seven. Kelly Bryant, their best player, was hurt in the last play of the second half, and then the offense couldn't get going, couldn't really move the ball, and they lost 27-24. However, I, don't, I feel like this won't hurt Clemson in the playoff run, as they lost to Pitt last year around the same time in the season, and if they win out, I think they could get into the playoff. The other team I picked, Washington State. Eight to 15, they were just horrible on both sides of the ball. The offense only scored three points, seven turnovers, and five of them were Luke Falk's interceptions, who I happened to say last week I really liked, and the offense, that didn't work out. The defense allowed 37 points to a Cal offense, who hadn't scored that many points all year. And the third team I picked, who also happened to lose Saturday night, Pac-12 after dark, was Washington. They dropped from five to 12. The defense was effective, but the offense literally just didn't do anything. Browning was held to 139 yards against an Arizona State defense, who coming to the game was 128th ranked in pass defense. That's just, you, that's unacceptable if you're Washington. This, I feel like, would help USC, the Washington and Washington State losses. They have to be flawless for the rest of the year, and they're going to need some help to sneak into the playoff picture. Yeah, I know uh, when you talk about Luke Falk at Wazoo, I mean, he threw five interceptions. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. that's almost going to eliminate him from the Heisman race. I mean, but, yeah, with Clemson, they're still right in this mm -hmm. because – like you said, they lost to Pitt last year, still were able to get there and win the national championship. So I don't think this is really going to affect their playoff yeah. chances that much. Like I said, it's October. There's still five, six games yep. left to play. So the national spotlight shines on Happy Valley this weekend as Penn State is set to host 19th ranked Michigan in front of a capacity whiteout crowd. So Jack, with college game day on hand and everyone talking about this one, can you remember a game that's had this much hype surrounding it in Beaver Stadium? So. I mean, we can go back to the Pitt game earlier this year. There was a lot of hype about that. But obviously, Pittsburgh wasn't very good, and they didn't look very good. Uh, you can go back next to 2011 when Alabama came to town. That was a pretty big game. I know the vice president of Nittanyville told me that, that was, the Pitt game was the biggest game since the Alabama game in 2011. But I think really the biggest game that uh, has happened in Happy Valley uh, was the 2009 Ohio State game. Uh, Penn State came into that game. They had been to the Rose Bowl the year before, and Ohio State handed them uh, a pretty significant loss. They ended up going to the Gator Bowl, or whatever it was called at that point, and beating LSU to finish that season 11-2 and for the second straight year. So it wasn't all that bad, but that was probably the biggest game 
that has happened. Game day wasn't at that game. Game day was actually at the Iowa game that year. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of things uh, going into this game that make it just as big because now Penn State, obviously they got back to the national spotlight last year, but now they have this big time game where they're expected to do well. Last year, the Ohio State game, Penn State wasn't really expected to beat Ohio State in that game. So it was in hindsight a huge win, but leading up to it, there wasn't that much hype. Yeah. So with Michigan quarterback Wilton Spate out with an undisclosed injury, Jim Harbaugh will stick with senior John O'Corn under center. David, do you think O'Corn has any potential to, to lead his team to an upset of the Indy Lions? Okay, so I know my picks haven't been great. They've actually been terrible. But John really O'Corn, they've been bad. <laughs> John O'Corn's atrocious. He's just not a good quarterback. Against Michigan State, he went 16 for 35 for 198 yards, threw three interceptions, and those three interceptions on three consecutive drives. Then last week against Indiana, 10 for 20 for 58 yards. That's 58 yards and four quarters of football and overtime. Not in a quarter. That's just unacceptable, and I don't think he's going to do well. So James Franklin's currently 0-3 against Jim Harbaugh, and Michigan is the only conference team that Penn State has never beaten in the Franklin era, besides Nebraska, who they'll face later this season. So any thoughts on that? Will that play any effect into this at all? I don't think it'll play any effect on it, but it will be significant for James Franklin. I know Texas A&M, there's that report out there that he's being courted by Texas A&M. So I think, should he beat Michigan, I think he'll be firmly in encased in Happy Valley and he'll be staying here for the long haul. All right, let's go rapid fire picks. Nittany Lions, Wolverines, who you guys got? Penn State. Penn State, I think they're going to cover the spread of 11.5 uh, in this one. All right, so that'll wrap up our college football segment for Jack Hirsch and David Padalano. I'm Matt Freiler. Up next, our experts discuss the downfall of the U.S. men's soccer team. Hi, welcome back to Penn State Sports Night. I'm Jordan Lewis, and alongside me is Matt Lingerman. On October 10th, the U.S. men's soccer team shocked the world by blowing their World Cup qualifying chances with a 2-1 loss to Trinidad and Tobago. With a win, the U.S. would have finished third in their group, meaning they would have gone directly to the World Cup group stage, and with the tie, they would have had a, to play a qualification match to then advance. However, the States conceded two first-half goals and couldn't rally in the second half, despite a great goal from Christian Pulisic. The United States' fifth-place finish has shocked players and fans alike and drops the huge question of what is wrong with the program. And Jordan, when you look at the game against Trinidad and Tobago, there are so many things that you can hit on. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago has as many people as eight U.S. cities. Um, they've only qualified to one World Cup in their history. Uh, they had nothing to play for. They were already, already disqualified from the World Cup. Yet they came out and just outplayed the U.S. on every single level. And as disheartening as that is to a United States soccer fan, what's even worse is when you look at the group qualification as a whole. I mean, they, lo they lost to Mexico at home in last November and they lost twice to Costa Rica by score differential of 6 nothing, And they drew Panama and Honduras in September. Those are just results that you can't have if you want to actually be a true contender in the World Cup uh, every cycle. And I think it seems like every cycle we have this conversation, like they might not qualify for the World Cup, this might be the year. And now that that finally happened, it has to kind of light a fire under them and make them realize changes need to happen. For a U.S. soccer fan, this is truly the most a uh, devastating thing to happen to the country in terms of soccer. Um, you know, with, with the MLS building up over the past 20 years, the country has made a uh, huge significant progress in, you know, adopting soccer as a, uh, as a national sport and getting more into it with uh, teams all over the country. And, um, you know, it's, it's just truly, it's just shocking. There's no other way to put it. And I would say what's most upsetting is for 19-year-old uh, star Kristen Pulisic. There's, there's a lot of pressure on this kid and now his his growth is going to be stunted by the fact that the U.S. did not qualify for the World Cup. And this leads to the question, where are the vets? Where, where are Dempsey? Where are Howard? You know, Dempsey came on as a, as a second-half sub mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the Trinidad and Tobago game, and, um, you know, there was nothing happened. Nothing lit a fire. Christian Pulisic scored early on, but the U.S. failed to score again. So that it's just shocking, honestly. I mean, you mentioned Christian Pulisic. He's, you know, I have no doubt in my mind he's the next United States star. He's the guy that maybe can bring them out of this. But at the same time, I don't understand how you can rely on a 19-year-old with no prior World Cup experience, who's you know, just starting to get his feet under him in European soccer, how you can rely on him to be the guy that's going to you know, qualify you to a World Cup. You have guys like Michael Bradley and Clint Dempsey and Tim Howard, guys with a ton of World Cup experience. I mean, six of the 11 starters 
in Monday's match against Trinidad played in the World Cup in 2014. So why are you leaning so heavily on a 19-year-old to, to be the guy for you? And to tell you the truth, I think it goes back to the, whole, the crux of this argument. That being, the U.S. has to decide if it's going to be a country that continually is the underdog role, which is a cool story and it's fun, you know, when they get out of the group of death last, last World Cup mm -hmm. and they play a good game with Belgium. But at some point they had to decide, are they just going to continue to do that and kind of swim in mediocrity? Or are they going to be a team that makes the group a group of death? Are they going to be the team that other countries fear when it gets right down to it? And I think now this might have lit enough of a fire where it's, it might be time for a United States soccer purge. And I'm not talking about a, an upheaval. I'm not talking about, you know, fire everybody from top to bottom. But guys like Michael Bradley and Clint Dempsey and even Tim Howard, Omar Gonzalez, I mean, the list goes on and on. I'm not so sure that they really have a place anymore uh, in, the, in the United so States soccer community. I think it's time to go uh, with more young guys. And definitely something needs to be addressed here with there's billions of dollars coming to the program and uh, Jurgen Klinsmann was brought in to, to do amazing things and granted he did and um, you know I think it was a poor decision to fire him in the end and Bruce Arena clearly hasn't done much better and has had a short, short term period as coach so something has to change for the program. With three years until the next World Cup qualification cycle begins it's going to be a while before we see what direction the United States chooses to take to ensure that a catastrophic collapse like this one doesn't happen again. Until then, Americans will have to do without meaningful United States men's team action. But they will be able to watch the women's team defend its 2015 World Cup title in 2019 in France. And Penn State fans, the men's loss shouldn't upset you too much. The last two times the United States men's team missed the World Cup, that being 1982 and 1986, Penn State football won the national title. For Jordan Lewis, I'm Matt Lingerman. Next, we'll head over to Penn State Sports Night's MLB postseason update. Welcome back to Penn State Sports Night. I'm Jeffrey Morgan alongside Josh Starr, who will give us an update on what has been going on in the MLB this postseason. As we record this segment, the Astros and the Yankees are playing Game 3, with the Astros leading the series 2 to nothing. Josh, let us in on what's been going on in the National League side, with the Dodgers up 2-0 in the series. Well, as you said, the Dodgers are up 2-0. The Cubs are really struggling to find pitchers that they can use in these late innings of these games and even to start the games in game five of the NLDS they used a ton of starting pitchers out of the bullpen and they're struggling to find people to pitch Jose Quintana started game one he he went longer than people expected but still not as much as the Cubs want out of their starting pitcher and in game two in the ninth inning instead of using Wade Davis which is a questionable call from Joe Madden they used John Lackey and he ended up giving up a walk-off home run to Justin Turner and the Dodgers took the 2-0 series lead. Also the Dodgers bullpen is really good. Kenley Jansen just shuts the door anytime he comes in and when the, Do when the Dodgers starting staff can give them a lead the, the game is pretty much over. Their bullpen has done a great job so far. The Cubs, they can do some to come back. I mean they had a chance in game one against Kershaw when he wasn't at his best, but they did not take advantage of that. And they can limit their walks and errors in game two, I believe. There was a play at first base. The pitcher was covering the bag. He dropped the ball, and he really, you know, that was a big mistake for the Cubs there. Mm -hmm. So a lot they can fix. And over on the American League side, the Astros are up 2 to nothing in the series. What do you see going on in that so far? Well, the, there's been great pitching in that series, uh, especially from the Houston starters. Dallas Keuchel in game one went seven innings, four hits, and ten strikeouts. That's just unreal, really. And Verlander continued that success again with nine innings and 13 strikeouts with only one run given up. The Yankees have not been able to get m muster much offense off of the Houston starting staff. And then also the Yankees' bullpen has been pretty good, except for the one blemish by Chapman, which really doesn't happen that much. He's, Ch he's a role as Chapman. He's mm -hmm. pretty he's good. pretty good. Yeah. Places. So they give, they've only given up one run in six and a third, which, you know, that's pretty good. But the, their offense hasn't been able to get it going. So they really, it's, it's kept them in games. It hasn't been, a, been able to help them win those games. Yeah, we're going to look for that to change over the next couple games, I guess, to see if they want to get back into it. Yeah. Who do you have winning the World Series now? 
Well, I have the Dodgers winning. I just think they're the most complete team left. The Yankees have proven that they have they their offense is struggling. The Astros, I think, are going to come out of the American League, and they're pretty good. I think I think the Dodgers bullpen will be able to handle their lineup late in late innings, and if they have a lead, they the Dodgers will be able to hold those leads and win the World Series. All right, so Clayton Kershaw gets that ever elusive ring. That'll be it, it for the MLB update. We'll be right back with our NBA preview. Welcome back to Penn State Sports Night. I'm Jeff Morgan alongside Jeremy Gaines and Brendan Pfeiffer to discuss the upcoming NBA season. Brendan, who do you see winning Rookie of the Year this year? You know, Jeff, I'm a huge fan of all the talent that's came out of the draft this year. I think it's one of the most talented draft classes we've seen in a while. But I have Dennis Smith Jr. taking home Rookie of the Year this year. As much as I like Ben Simmons, and Markel Fultz and a lot of the other guys. I think right now Dennis Smith is the most complete player. We got to see it during Summer League. And Ben Simmons, De'Aaron Fox, Lonzo Ball, I like all of them, but I don't think they're as offensively gifted right now as Dennis Smith Jr. Um, I think Dennis Smith, as the floor general for the Mavericks, he's gonna have a lot of opportunities to make things happen, to lead that team, and he's gonna put some points on the board. And Jason Tatum, I know he's a guy flying under the radar, but with all the talent in Boston, he might not necessarily get the playing time. So with that being said, I'm gonna have to give it, with, give it to Dent Smith. All right, and Jeremy, how about you? Funnily enough, I actually think that Jason Tatum will win the Rookie of the Year for the exact reason that Brennan just gave. I think there's not a lot of pressure on him at all to do well, although it would be very nice if he broke out this year and I expect him to ju do just that. Uh, he has people like Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving there to lead the way for him and also take some of that heat off. And I really liked what I saw from him in the preseason. thought he was really a really efficient scorer and played both sides of the ball very well. So I expect big things from him this year, and I expect him to win the Rookie of the Year. And who do you have for MVP? For MVP, I have Kevin Durant. This year, it's not going to be LeBron James. It's going to be the other number one player in the league, Kevin Durant, because he is going to have a great year this year. Uh, he's. It's really his time to take over the Warriors and become the true leader of that team. I think he's going to take over from Steph Curry and become the player that makes everyone better on that team. All right, and how about you, Brendan? Who do you see winning the MVP? So we're kind of like in this super team era where it's like two or three superstars mm -hmm. on the team. And with that being said, I think everyone's stats kind of go down. But the only elite player that I see right now that's not on a super team that has such a clear path to individual mm -hmm. dominance is Kawhi Leonard. If we look at the other MVP candidates, if we look at James Harden, we look at Russell Westbrook, look at these guys. They're also surrounded by all-stars, so their numbers are going to be down. And I don't think Russell Westbrook, as great as he is, I don't see him putting up triple doubles in half the games this year as he did last year. And as the Spurs age and get responsibilities, they get they're more and more. Like He has to do more for that team. He can't afford to sit out back-to-backs like LeBron. So with that being said, I have to give it to Kawhi this year. And he's getting better each year as well, so I think this year he takes it home. All right, Jeremy, finals winning team is going to be? Well, if you're looking for any surprises here, you're not going to find any. I have Golden State Warriors versus the Cleveland, Clav Cleveland Cavaliers mm -hmm. winning in seven games. All right. You have it going to seven? Yes. All right. And how about you, Brendan? For me, I'm going to have to agree with Jeremy over here. I'm going to say the Warriors, but I got the Warriors in six. The Warriors, they necessarily, they didn't really get better, mm -hmm. but they didn't have to. They're already good enough. Mm -hmm. And I think the East is really weak. Aside from the Celtics and the Cavs, that's pretty much it. And I think the Cavs take out the Celtics maybe in six games or so in their series. And then over in the West, the Warriors, they'll probably get it done over OKC. I think OKC, their super team, they're going to gel just enough, just in time for the playoffs. So I have, but I do have the Warriors beating them. And with that being said, Warriors over Cavs, six games, that's going to be your champion this year. All right, that'll do it for this week's edition of Penn State Sports Night. Be sure to check out our Twitter page and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.